Hello everybody and welcome back to I Was a Teenage Exocolonist. So today we are going to be continuing our friendship with Tammy and building up our friendship from there. We are going to save uh, Professor Howell. And also someone in the comments of the last video let me know that if we want to actually date Tammy, we're going to have to make Cal back off, basically. Um, and that's going to involve basically asking him not to, but apparently we need a high friendship with him for that. So we we're also going to be trying to befriend Cal and also seeing if we have enough bravery to actually do his cool little game today without Mars making us back off. Because every time I've tried it, we've been able to get, like, the farthest I've gotten is getting part, like, outside and then Mars confronts you and then you you don't, you aren't brave enough to stop. So maybe this time we will be, because we have 22. I think it was 20? I don't remember. Hopefully it will be. So we'll continue raising our friendship with uh, Dees, Tammy, and Cal. Um, but first, Mom wants to talk to us. Oh no! <laughs> Gabby, come here. Uh-oh, you know that tone of voice, those raised eyebrows, the pinched mouth. Your mom's mad about something. You slink over to her and cross your arms. I know you haven't been going to school, she says tiredly. She leans hard on her rake. We talked about this. You have to focus on your studies or you'll end up shoveling dirt or delivering packages for the rest of your life. Howell wants to see you in class, and damn it, she says, pointing a finger at you. Don't think he doesn't tell me about you skipping out on lessons. Your job, your only job, is to train up that big brain I gave you so you can keep this colony running when we're gone. Your eyes go wide, but she shakes her head. I know you don't want to hear it, but I won't be here forever. You kids are tomorrow's governors, chief engineers, and chief cultivators. Maybe sooner than you think. I'll do what I want! Your mom narrows her eyes and raises her upper lip. Ah, a threat display. You've seen this before. You'll do as you're told, she says, raising her voice. For now, you're still just a child. You should be in school, learning how to function as an adult, not playing around like some dumbass. Whoa, whoa, your dad cuts in, looking up from his hollow palm. Hold on, let's dial it back a little there. We live in a society, Yabby. No! The Joker got to her! <laughs> your mom continues, unswayed. You can't just run around doing whatever you want. You have to act like you give a shit. I am acting like I give a shit. I have a carefully formulated plan you don't understand. Flulu, your dad says, sharp. Go take a walk. Let me deal with this. Your mom throws her rake to the ground and stomps away. Your dad turns to you. She just wants you to have a good head on your shoulders, Pumpkin, he says. Growing up on the compound, we didn't have the same kind of freedoms. It's hard to stand back and let you make your own mistakes. He gives you a hug. Please try to go to class more often, he says. Pick something. Pick anything. It'll open up a lot of doors as you get older. All right! But only because you didn't mildly threaten me. Like Mom did. It, oh, here it is. Let's see if we can do it. You're looking for Cal in the garden when you nearly trip over someone else, one of the younger kids, and they're blindfolded? Hey, they exclaim, ripping a blindfold off their face and throwing it to the ground. It's Cirrus, one of Anemone's brothers. He glares at you. I was almost done! Cal jogs over and grabs Cirrus in a friendly headlock, ruffling his messy red hair. Dude, you were so close! Cirrus stamps his feet and complains that you got in his way. It's not their fault, Cal says. They didn't know we were playing a game. Give me a sec, I want to teach them how to play. Cal turns to you as Cirrus leaves. Sorry, Yabby, he says sheepishly. I was teaching Cirrus a new game, but he's more like Anemone than I thought. Real competitive, you know? He stoops to flick up the blindfold, brushing off the dirt. I've been trying to come up with different kinds of games other than sports ball, he says. No winners or losers. I just want to have fun with my friends. Cal looks at you, hopefully. Do you want to learn how to play? Uh, yes! Hopefully you can do it this time. Cal looks up with, like, looks like it's gonna... Cal's smile looks like it's gonna stretch right off of his face. Radical, he shouts, jumping up and down with excitement. Okay, so first, put on this blindfold. The blindfold is a little scratchy and smells like dirt. You can feel Cal's big hands on your shoulders. I'm gonna spin you around, and when I let go, you gotta listen to my instructions. We're gonna walk all the way to the cafeteria, okay? You nod. You can't see Cal's grin, but you hear it in his voice as he spins you around and counts to ten. One, two, three... First, you gotta walk for ten steps. Do you follow Cal's instructions as best you can or make things difficult? Do your best. You take ten steps forward, holding your hands out for balance. The rocky dirt between the garden beds crunches under your feet. Yeah, Cal says. Now turn to your right and take fifteen steps until you get to the door. Get it right. You turn to the right and walk forward, counting out fifteen steps. When you stop, Cal laughs. You can hear his footsteps crunching behind you. I forgot how much bigger I am than you. You're like two more steps away. 
You take two more steps until your outstretched hands land on the warm metal of the door. Success! Awesome, Cal says. You can't help but smile. This is fun. Now hit the door button on the right, and then keep walking forward until I say stop. Go really slowly, okay? You open the door and start to walk forward. The path slopes downward and your feet slip a little bit, even though you're moving as slowly as you can. Real dirt is nothing like the metal floors of the stratospheric. It's turbo rocky here, Cal says, and you can feel uneasiness prickle up the back of your arms. Just keep going forward slowly. Can you trust him? I trust him. You slowly creep down the slope to the center of the colony, somehow managing not to bump into anything. Cal cheers. Okay, now turn a little to your right and keep walking straight. We're so close. You carefully pick your way forward, stopping when you hear Mars's unmistakable voice ring across the courtyard. What are you nullheads doing? Cal tells her you're playing a game. Is that a real game? Mars scoffs. It looks like Yabby's just wandering around with a scarf over their eyes. Aren't you a little old for this? Ignore her! We got it! It was 20 bravery! You say nothing, even though the embarrassment burns across your face. No one's too old to have fun, Cal says. Mars humphs. You hear her shoes click as she stomps away, unsatisfied. You make it all the way across the courtyard without further incident. Cal stops you and takes off your blindfold. Ta-da! Cal exclaims, throwing his arms wide. We made it! Good job, us! He pushes open the doors to the cafeteria. You know, he says, you're the first person who has made it all the way to the end. We make a good team, Yabby. And we made a good couple, too, in an alternate world! You celebrate your joint victory by ordering two tall glasses of potato juice and spend the rest of the afternoon brainstorming more games where there are no winners or losers. We did it! Take that, Mars! You couldn't stop us forever. Okay, so we have 19 friendship with... Tammy, 12 with Cal, 17 with Deese. Ironically, 10 with Anemone. I don't even know how that happened. So we gotta keep it up. Maybe I'll do some work in... I'll alternate between Geophonics and Tammy. Maybe. Just so Mom doesn't yell at us again. Oh, we definitely need to help Socks again. Is that... Socks? Oh! Cal blinks at you in confusion. Why would I keep my socks in a barn? Whatever Cal is going to say next is interrupted by the chirping noise from the box. Oh! See, I told you it was socks! Cal puts a small creature on his shoulder. He touches one of its w six white-capped feet. You're right! What a coincidence! I guess I'll call it Socks. Socks the Dilly Pillar. <laughs> I'll sleep when I'm dead! Your dad laughs at your audacity, but then he sighs and shakes his head. The buzzberry did not fall far from the vine, he says. You and your mom are the same. Just promise me you'll take a break before it gets to that point, okay? No, I will be dead. And it will be my fault. A stomach bug is growing through the crush right now, and everyone is absolutely miserable. You and Tammy have both missed the worst of it, but antecedent and a majority of the kids are taking it pretty rough. Tammy is cleaning up a vomit incident by the hollowed projector while you strip the affected kids and get them into the bath. You come out with a bundle of soiled clothes and trade off with Tammy, who gives you the mop and a bucket to take back to the laundry room while she finishes up with the kids. After so long working together, especially during this latest crisis, you're getting pretty good at working as a team. Annie Seaton pops her head in the creche to check on you. There are broken ca capillaries under her eyes, and her greasy hair is up in a bonnet, but she still gives you a tired smile, then her nose wrinkles at the lingering smell of vomit. You're a hero, she says. Thank you so much for tackling the kids for me. You look down at the mop and bucket and dirty clothes in your hand. Does she think you did it all by yourself? Tammy did most of the cleaning. Annie Seaton laughs. You're both doing great, she says. Please tell Tammy I'm very grateful for your help. She leaves, but not before sending you both some kudos. Tammy comes out holding one of the younger kids wrapped in a towel and two older ones weaving tiredly behind her in robes. She's starting to look tired. I was going to put these little Kiki to bed, she says. I should spray down the floor with some antiseptic too, and then I'll sterilize the bathtub, then... Well, I guess we'll need to sterilize the bottles again and boil and cool some more water and... Oh, by then the laundry will be done. You don't have to do everything yourself. Tammy puts on a determined smile. It's okay, she says. It's my job, right? We all need to do our best and, well, I am. That's what people need me to be right now. That's all. Grow a backbone! Oh no, I'm sorry. Hang on. Time travel. Just make sure you take care of yourself. Tammy's nose goes pink like her hair. Oh, Yabby, she laughs. Don't worry, I do. Just not when someone needs me. She takes the kids into a quiet room for their nap. 
All right, I forgot that like with Tammy, you want to like, you do want to like try and help her confidence, but being very aggressive about it is not going to encourage her. Oh, Tammy is sitting in a little stool in the sun, reading a fairy tale picture book on her hollow palm. She sighs. Are you okay? Um, I'm okay, she hesitates. It's just that, look at all these pictures of princes and princesses. The princes are always the taller ones, but I'm so big. I'm even taller than Cow. How can he be my prince if I'm bigger than him? It's true, Tammy is the tallest kid, you know. Taller than the boys, even Cow, who's a year older. You know she and Cow are close friends, but you never thought of him as her prince before. I like you just the way you are. I'm flirting immediately. That's really nice, Yabby, Tammy smiles. Then she suddenly looks startled. Oh, do you mean like, like? You tell her that she's beautiful exactly the way she is and you wouldn't change a thing. She blushes, embarrassed, and unable to think of what else to do, she goes back to fl flipping through the pages of her book, smiling now. Dang, our first flirt, very young. She needed to know, she is amazing, beautiful, I love her pink hair. As a pink cat myself, I'm very impressed. Oh! Perform a random act of kindness. You start simple. You give Tammy an enormous hug, sharing the love. Tammy gets a lot of hugs, but you make sure this one feels special. She hugs you back, wiggling back and forth happily. She's surprisingly strong. Thanks, Yabby, she says breathlessly as you squeeze the wind out of her a little. I really, really needed that. Oh, before you go, she adds, and produces a bock with a slice of cake in it from the folds of her skirt. Do you want this cake? They're so fun to make, but I need someone to help me eat them. I'll make you another on your birthday if you like, and we can trade hugs for cakes again. Aw, you're so sweet. Alright, we'll do class, and then we'll sneak out so our mom will leave us alone. Oh, Valentine's Day! No, you dummy, Mars starts, then pauses and gives you a suspicious look. Wait, what did you say? Well, anyway. <laughs> it's time for Valentine's. Let's make Tammy our BFF. Tammy is humming tunelessly while she braids blades of grass together. Want to be best friends? Um, Cal already asked me, she says, poking her two index fingers together. But I don't see why I can't have two best friends. She laughs nervously. I don't really understand the rules. Here, I'm already making a friendship bracelet for Cal, she says, showing off her braided grass. I'll make one for you too, best friend. Aww. Two besties. Mars is in a huff. Seems like nobody picked her. She crosses her arm and scowls at you. You and Cal and Tammy broke the system. You're only supposed to have one BFF. Don't you know that? I cheat the system. I'm a rebel. The system is for losers. Speaking of breaking the system, I'm going outside. Alright, so I know I did the talent show last time, but I feel like we should save that one for Mars's run. Um, so for now, we're going to continue with the science fair, since that's the one Tammy's in, and that will get us more friendship with her. And then we will do the talent show next time, and then once the science fair is gone, uh, or once Tammy stops doing that, we'll, we'll probably move on to the bake-off. So, uh, I believe I have done most of the science fair in that one, so we probably won't see Vertumnalia for a little while, just letting you know. Little Nougat is absolutely fearless for a five-year-old. She speaks bravely to adults and hates being patronized by anyone. It's usually endearing, but Tammy has been trying to get her to put her toys away for afternoon quiet time, and Nougat is not having it. You can't make me, Nougat shouts for the third time. First, I can't play in Zero G, then I can't play with the nano printer. No, no, no. I'm gonna run away and live in the jungle and play all day and nobody tells me what to do. Tammy looks to you for help. Wanna give this a try? You, ex you explain to Nougat that she can't play in Zero G because we aren't in space anymore, and she's too young to use the nano printer, especially after she filled the entire room with rubber ducks that time. Nougat, as usual, is not having it. No, no, no! Nougat shoves you out of the way and begins running around like a tornado, knocking things off tables. Okay, so frighten her with your scary face or negotiate with Nougat. I will negotiate. You corner Nougat and crouch down to her level to negotiate. You make a deal. She'll put away all her toys except one and play quietly instead of napping. Then, nobody has to live in the jun jungle. Three toys, she counters. Ah, a negotiator. <laughs> you tell her two is your final offer and shake hands. 
Aw, Tammy breathes. She's been watching the whole time, and she's impressed that you managed it in such a gentle way. Yay, friendship! I bet if we did the scary face one, she would have been like, what are you doing? Oh, yay! Tammy is crying and trying to hide it. Wiping her eyes and blowing snot into her sleeve. Oh, what's the matter? I, she hiccups, I watched that scary movie last night at the lounge. You remember it, Mothra vs. Godzilla, the 2085 remake version. Well, she's sniffling, I had a bad dream where the monsters were knocking at my bedroom window and they were trying to get in. Now I can't stop thinking about it. I miss being in space. It was so much safer there. The soldiers will keep us safe. I hope so, she sniffs, but I can hear the monsters at night sometimes. Real ones out in the jungle. I can hear them trying to get in. They're scary. You both look towards the walls. She does have those big ears. Maybe she really can hear creatures gathering in the jungle, scratching at the walls looking for weak points. The thought gives you shivers. Oh, and they definitely are, because we know they're being controlled by the gardeners. Poor Tammy, that has to be awful. No wonder she didn't want to go outside. All right, we gotta go outside, we gotta save Tonin. I know he's right there, but we gotta go outside right now. I can't forget this time. I will save you! You hear screams from just over the next bluff. Human screams. Oh! I think the only other time I saved him was when Tammy was n dead, so this is the first time they may be alive together. You crest the bluff to see Tammy's father, Chief Surveyor Tonin. He's being attacked by something you've never seen before. A four-legged creature with a huge mane of flowers, a mean reptilian face, and two wicked claws. Whoa, is this a manticore? You've heard of fierce creatures like this outside the walls, but you never expected to ever see one up close. What is one doing so close to the colony? Uncle Tonin is pinned under one of the creature's pointed legs. He's struggling to get free, but the manticore keeps dancing around like it's playing with food. You can hear it from here, growling and clicking its mandibles. But you snuck out! If you try to help, he's gonna know you snuck out and your parents are gonna be so mad if they find you there. Panic rises in your chest. How could you even help him? It's a huge deadly monster! Try to distract it! You hide behind trees and throw a rock at it. It bounces harmlessly off the manticore's flank and clatters to the ground. The manticore is undisturbed, which is more than you can say about yourself. Uncle Tonin shouts in pain. You're running out of time! Oh, thank goodness for bravery! Combat! <laughs> There we go. You break through the tree line, yelling your battle cry. The manticore looks up from terrorizing Tonin and decides you can use a bit of terrorizing yourself. It roars, a deep angry sound you can feel liquefy your guts. With literally nothing on you except a few rocks you could pick up from the clearing, you manage to piss off the ferocious manticore enough that it decides to go after you instead. Or maybe it just thinks it'd pick off the smaller, more tender prey before coming back for the main course. Either way, it leaps off Uncle Tony and it starts towards you. As you're about to engage with it in the most one-sided battle of your young life, you smell the crackle of ozone in the air and the manticore howls in pain. Uncle Tonin! He must have distracted the manticore long enough for him to get his blast rifle. The manticore turns and flees and you run over to Uncle Tonin's side. Yabby, he gasps. I don't know why you're out here, but I'm so glad to see you. I bet you are. Together, you manage to limp him back to the gates. He'll be fine after an afternoon in a med bed, which is a relief, but you're even more relieved when you don't get in trouble for sneaking out. You don't know what he told your mother, but it was a miracle that you weren't grounded for life. I mean, he probably said, Ayo, hey, yo, she saved my life. Tammy! <laughs> Chief Surveyor Tonin has come to your quarters to personally thank you for saving him from the manticore. Ever since he returned, Tammy's barely let him out of her sight. She stammers out her thanks as well. If it weren't for you, she'd be an orphan. They both owe you a great debt. I'm stepping down as Chief Surveyor, Uncle Tonin says. I think it's about time I take up a job inside the colony walls. I wasn't built for life outside the ship, I think. He squeezes Tammy's hand. Someone like Utopia has the youthful reflexes to stay safe out there in the jungle. She'll do great out there as the new Chief Surveyor. For that matter, so would you, he continues. I know you weren't supposed to be out there, but I would have died if you weren't. 
If that has to count for something, when Utopia offers you a spot in Expeditions, you should take her up on it. You'd have done the same. Tammy presents you with a basket of cookies. She's written thank you on each one when flowery writing. Aw, sweetheart. Tonin holds his hand up, brushing you off. It was important to me, he says. Because of you, I'll be around to see my little girl grow up. Oh, you guys are like the most wholesome people ever. And neither of you are dead. <laughs> That's the best part. We will not go to the crash. We're going to engineering. You don't know what compels you, but okay, we're here to save you. I'm here to save you again. Everyone will live except my dad this run, because I've never let him die when mom's alive before. I'm a jerk like that. There we go. We got it. You saved Professor Hal's life! We did it! We saved Tammy, we saved Tonin, we saved Hal, and, and now everybody's alive for now. Your days are numbered. But everyone else will live. Uh, and that is where we will end it for today. We're going a little slower with the Tammy run, but I feel like that's because there's a lot of stuff that I haven't explored, especially in the crash. I've pretty much avoided it unless I needed to relax. I think we did a few cooking things and like one or two babysitting, but we never went really far with it. So we will go even further next time. Until then, thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, please consider subscribing. Remember to take care of yourself, eat Tammy's amazing cookies, and have a good day.